Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's VitoDens 200 B2HA, B2HB Wiring and Control Interface Basic Programming Webinar. My name is Miranda Getling, and I'm the Academy Manager here at Beesman. I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you for attending today. We appreciate you taking the time to attend this webinar despite what we are all going through. Today, your webinar instructor will be Jay Sheldon. Jay has been with Beesman for the last five years. The first three years, he was a member of the Technical Service Department before moving into his current role as the Academy Training Instructor. Jay has a master license, has been in the heating and cooling industry for the past 30 years, including holding jobs titles as general manager, service manager, and owning his own company for 14 years. Jay is a United States Army vet and loves to spend time with his wife, two children, and two grandsons. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. Everyone will stay muted throughout the webinar. However, you have the ability to ask questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. On the left, you will see the desktop laptop version, and on the right is the mobile device version. Jay will be stopping about halfway through each presentation and at the end to answer any questions submitted, so feel free to pop them in there at any time. This webinar will be re recorded and it will be posted on the video library within the next two weeks on the same website you went to to register for this webinar. Once you're in that video library, you will have to click the recorded webinar section and then you will hit the discover more button twice in order for all of the videos to populate. Like I said, this will be up within the next two weeks, so you will be able to go back at that time and rewatch it. With that being said, let's begin. Here is Jay Sheldon. Thanks, Miranda, and welcome, everybody. Uh, today's class is going to be on the uh, Vito Dens 200HA and HB boiler. We're going to go over some programming and some wiring today. With that being said, before I get started, uh, Miranda, just uh, make sure we update that picture because um, my hair's in a ponytail now and I don't remember the last time I had a, a button up shirt on um, and sweatpants and a t-shirt today, just playing. But anyways, uh, when we get started, before I get started, I, I wanted to do this in the last one I did earlier today. Uh, I, I uh, Automatically, I already downloaded this, uh, what it's called Pro Login. And in the, all the services that we offer and uh, any troubleshooting or anything like that you need, current product manuals, historic product manuals, warranties, uh, things that I like to show is that fault code checker here as well. Uh, any faults you get, you punch that fault in there. When you open this up, it's gonna ask you, uh, are you a contractor or a, a, you know, a, a non-contractor? If you're a contractor, you're gonna pick this. And by the way, these are for contractors, uh, these glasses here as well. Uh, and to do any of this work, uh, it's in the manual to be a licensed contractor or a contractor. With that being said, the fault code checker is a, a nice place, but all these things are in here that you can see here, as well as uh, uh, if you go up to the man, uh, menu here, uh, any of our academy things, uh, you'll find uh, in this as well. So you'll go to your academy and then pick on that. And then any of the uh, webinars I've been doing recently uh, are all on there as well as today's as well. So with that being said, I'm gonna start with the um, wiring of the boiler today. Uh, and we'll go over that uh, to start. And then we'll go get into some programming. But I find that once you see the wiring part of it, it helps with the programming part of this boiler here because uh, we have now the, uh, the wizard on this boiler here. So it helps you pick your, your pump placements. And so to know which pump placements you're picking and know where they where you're gonna wire your uh, circulators or your pumps uh, is very helpful. So with that being said, we're gonna get started here. So today's learning objective is uh, we're gonna go over the uh, low voltage as well as the line voltage, uh, your sensory uh, placements, as well as uh, they're all, uh, all our sensors are auto recognized. So meaning that means once you plug them into our boiler, they now know it has it. We'll go over the quality of the uh, controls uh, that sets us apart from others as well. Um, you'll see it can do different, a bunch of different things. Uh, well, I'll go over the flow switches as well as flow sensors in these boilers. On the smaller ones, we have flow switches. On the larger ones, we have ultrasonic sensors. Go over a couple of different ways to uh, wire in your low water cutoff if needed by your inspectors. 
Uh, most cases, the flow switches and the flow sensors are approved to be your low water cutoff. Uh, if you do need any type of paperwork on that to show your uh, inspectors, uh, I know in some states they still want to require a manual uh, low water cutoff with a reset. Uh, <clears throat> it, this does both as well. Uh, but uh, your reps would have that paperwork if needed. If you do have this symbol on your boiler here, that means you do have the startup wizard on this boiler because our prior ones uh, did not have the symbol. Uh, the symbol is representing of a boiler linked to a thermostat, meaning you can run an end switch or, uh, or T-stat even right directly to the boiler. It has to be a dry contact as well. So let's go take a look inside the boiler and where we're gonna get to the wiring of this boiler here. So the first thing you really have to do is pull this bottom apron off. And that's very bottom here. You slide that directly out towards you. The next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna, after you slide that out, you're gonna look up here and up underneath here, recessed up in holes. I don't know why, but they're up there pretty good. Uh, are two screws, one on each side. You're gonna loosen that, you'll hear them drop. Once they drop, then you'll be able to lift this uh, cover up and then out. Once we have that cover off, uh, we see this, uh, this here has already been opened up, but this is actually underneath the boiler with a metal cover on that uh, top of this. There's two screws on the top, on the top front here, or in the front that hold that cover on. And then there's two screws on each side that you uh, take out so you can actually slide this control out and then fold it down so you can wire it. So it makes it nice and easy. You can actually just sit right there and wire it. All your knockouts are in, located in the back. These little spots here to hold your stranded wire. So once you pull that wire through, you hook them into here and then you can tie them into your connections here. Looking at once we fold that control down where we're gonna do our wiring. And on all our boilers, it's always been our incoming power has always been our 40 plug. So that 40 plug here on the right hand side is our incoming power. Uh, so that would be our incoming power. I always recommend it. I think it does rec uh, recommend in the uh, thing to add a, uh, a service man switch. So you want to kill power going to this boiler when you want to service it because that button up top on the top control is not going to kill the power down here on this 40 plug. What we're looking at on the right hand side is called the power pump module. And then on the left hand side, as you can see on the top here is called our EA1 module. On this side here on your power pump module, most of all the side is all line voltage. So all your line voltage is done on this side here. So your incoming power, your boiler pump, because this boiler does require a, a boiler pump. And as you know, there's nine different sizes of this boiler. And as they go from the 94,000 up to 530,000 BTUs, the pump sizes are gonna change as well as your GPMs through the boiler. Uh, so this is always usually dedicated for that boiler pump because we're gonna pipe these boilers primary, secondary, because there's only a gallon to four gallons of water in these boilers. 21 is usually designated uh, as your DHW pump if you're doing DHW. If you're not doing DHW, you can uh, change that encoding to make it a system pump. as well as the 2820, as you'll find through this uh, pro, uh, programming uh, later today, that uh, you can either change this uh, from a, a recirculation pump to a heating pump. And when you do use the startup wizard, this is one of the pump outputs that it asks you, do you wanna use this one or another one? And lastly on this one here is your multi-plug. It's a low water or an accessory. Uh, you can power your low water cutoff, come back on your, so you go up on your L, and then come back on your one. And you can power your low water cutoff there. That will keep the boiler operational. Um, it won't fire, uh, but your pumps will stay running. Uh, as what you can also put your low water cutoff into your 40 plug and kill the power directly to the boiler. Looking at the other side at the EA1 module, the A1 module is a couple of outputs here. That 157 would be one of the other circulator choices uh, if you're using the startup wizard. 
If you are using that 157 plug output, you'll see further down in the uh, presentation how to wire that. Next to that 157 plug output, you have a zero to 10 input. So if you have a zero to 10 thermostat, or a zero to 10 input, like uh, maybe a Tecmar control doing snow melt, uh, you can send a zero to 10 volt over to this control. As well as we can take end switches to those DE1, DE2, DE3s, or just a thermostat to, uh, DE1 or DE2 or DE3. That 145 at the end there, uh, if you have any of our controls like our mixing valves or veto troll or any of that, that would get wired with a thermostat wire directly here. Or if you're using the EA1 module, it comes a uh, um, uh, AM1 module, I'm sorry. Uh, AM1 module is an extension if you want to add more pumps for the boiler to see. And that's something that we offer. Looking up at uh, the control above this one. So now you can see that control that we were just looking at is this control right here. So those would be the two screws that you would take out. And then there's a screw here and one on the other side, you take those out. And then that allows this whole control to slide forward and then it folds down. The next control we're actually looking at is this one up top here. Uh, there's two orange tabs. You're gonna fold those orange tabs down. Once you fold those down, then it allows the control to come down. If you must have these doors closed, you'll see coming up uh, that those doors have to be closed so you, uh, those tabs can come down all the way. Once we uh, fold those down, on top of that uh, control, uh, you'll see these, this orange cover. There's little tabs on the left and the right. So these ones here, is, uh, these ones you're looking at. So you're gonna pry something underneath there or your fingernail, pull those up and lift up. Once you lift those up, there's two more in the back. You lift those and then it allows you to take this orange cover off. The only reason why we have to take that off is uh, to install our outdoor sensor, uh, which you'll find is uh, gonna be our number one sensor and our number two sensor, which is our low loss header sensor. And uh, that comes with the boiler when you get it. Uh, and uh, when we're doing primary and secondary, that's always checking. Just make sure that we're getting the most accurate temperatures going out to your system. So that's your low loss header sensor. So once you'll, you'll keep hearing me talk about numbers, your number five sensors, your domestic, all our numbering system is the same from our 100 right up to our commercial boilers. So once you learn our numbering system, you'll know pump outputs and such. Uh, it, it makes life easier once you learn them all, it, because they're all the same. What else are we looking at inside the box here? So those sensors are gonna go to an orange plug. You'll see in the next slide what a, uh, a better picture here. Uh, right here, if you do let the genie out of the box or the smoke out of the box, right inside there, there is your fuse for this control. And right in the center of that plastic piece is a spare fuse. So if you do let the smoke out of the box, there is a fuse there. Over here, you would put your long card. Uh, in this picture here, it says, uh, shows uh, KMK, and that's Wiesman's uh, communication. So uh, we did that for quite some years. And that was just the thermostat from this control to your next boiler. So if you were doing multiple boilers, it would communicate to each other. Mostly now everybody does lawn communication for building management. Uh, we also give a lawn uh, class as well as a multi-boiler hookup, as well as the controls for that as well. Uh, in live and on hand. So it, it makes it uh, fun when you can do it by hand. And you, I, I think it sticks in my brain better. So now we're looking at that orange plug where your number one outdoor sensor is gonna go over here to one and two. Your 145 communication here. That's what's communicating down to the bottom part of the boiler. And then we can actually put a zero to 10 output. So I've been working with this a little bit in the shop just to see how it works. Uh, this is more stuff uh, to make the boilers more efficient so we can modulate that pump up and down uh, accordingly. Uh, so some neat features with this boiler that others don't have. Looking at that fuse again. So now you can see right in the center there, there's your spare fuse right here. So you just pull that up and then uh, at the very bottom, you'll see the, the uh, blown fuse, and then in the middle is your uh, 
uh, spare fuse, uh, which we also do troubleshooting with these boilers. Uh, we have switches that we can create faults. So hopefully this will be over soon and everybody can get uh, hands on and even if we're all wearing masks. Your outdoor sensor now would go on to uh, terminal plug three and that's that orange plug. You can pull it right out and wire it in. And so one and two is where your outdoor temperature sensor is. And we're gonna locate that outdoor sensor on the north, uh, north northwest side of the building, which is normally your coldest side of the building. Uh, normally they recommend um, eight feet off the ground, mine are about four feet, and they've been that way for about 22 years and then work fine. Uh, coldest spot of my house though, I know that for sure. Your low loss header sensor is now gonna connect to that same number three orange plug, but these are gonna get wired into three and four on that plug. So outdoor sensor, one and two, the low loss header sensor, four and five. And on our low loss header sensors, uh, there's actually a uh, well right here for the sensor to go in on the small uh, residential ones, which the well actually sits inside this pipe here. Uh, so you can always check what you're going out. If you don't know about our low loss headers, they're actually designed for this reason to actually push the water down and let the air flow out. So I normally used to take that key out and then put a high vent in there. Our domestic sensor, which is our number five sensor on our boiler, uh, on all our boilers. Uh, so uh, once you learn our numbering system, uh, you'll know that uh, where they go and uh, that they're all for what they're for. So on this boiler here, you're gonna have these two red plugs on top. Uh, I'll show you in a, a couple of slides up. Uh, where that's actually sticking. And then you're gonna put it in our, uh, in our tanks. They actually have a, on the smaller ones, there's a well port that goes from here all the way down inside. So you take the top cover off and then you'll see our, uh, our well placement there. That's what the number five plugs look like. Uh, so they do say number five. Remember domestic is our number five sensor. Remember everything that you plug in sensor-wise is auto-recognized, but it is not de-recognized. So you actually have to go into program. I'll go over that uh, a little later when we get into programming that you have to unprogram. So you have to unplug it and then go into program and take them out. They recognize when you plug them in, but they don't uh, unrecognize. Just showing you different places where you would put your pumps, your sensors. And I always, at this point, I like to point out the way they have this piped as well uh, for uh, reasonings uh, for programming. So when you're looking over here, this is our number 20 pump output, right? Remember we talked about that for our boiler pump, which activates that flow switch or flow sensor inside the boiler. Um, so over here, we're looking at the 28, 20 pump output. So it can either be a system pump or it can be a recirculation pump. As we get into programming, you'll see that we have time programs for recirculation for your domestic. And that what that means is you have a loop going around your house, so it's always constantly circulating hot water. So as soon as you open up your faucet, you have hot water there. Um, so we have a time program where you can put the times in there when you want it to run and shut off uh, to operate that as well. Over here, as you can see, our 20 pump output is here and that's pumping in. So we're uh, circulating the water through the boiler and activating that flow switch. Just notice where they have the 21 pump, which is our domestic uh, indirect pump. It's piped right above that in, uh, uh, your boiler pump. And that, that's for a reason, because when you're doing priority with the domestic on the primary side, and this is what we're calling the primary side is the side here where all your piping is being separated from your system side with the low loss header or your closing space fees. When the DHW is activated, it shuts this pump down and then this pump takes over and activates that flow switch. Uh, if you have your indirect on your system side, uh, there's a program where you have to tell it, uh, you'll see it's 5B in programming that you have to tell it that you're on the system side. 
So it will keep that pump running. So it keeps the hot water going through here. So when you're pulling out to your domestic, that pump is what's activating. Looking at our numbering system in the hole here. Even our parts and everything have uh, plugs as well. But going through a, like our line voltage, so now you can see our power supply is the 40. The 20 pump is line voltage, uh, 21, 28, 20. Uh, 157 is actually a dry contact. Uh, you would have to power that 157, which I'll show you further down in wiring. And then that multi-plug, you have to remove the jumper and then run your power up to your uh, low water and then back to continue the circuit on the boiler. So it is a safety circuit. Remembering that all our sensors are auto recognized. Uh, so as soon as you plug that number five sensor in, it now knows it has domestic with an outdoor temperature sensor, as well as now with a, a low loss header sensor. Your DEs, they must be dry contacts, meaning whatever you're landing there must be a dry contact. So it can't be a power scaling thermostat or a power scaling zone control has to be a dry switch. If you don't, then you would have to put some type of ribby relay to separate that voltage. When using the startup wizard, or using zone circuits, this is where you would land your end switches or just your thermostat to activate the pumps on our boiler. So we can do operation of the boiler as well as your system. So with the out outputs, we're running uh, the boiler, your domestic, and a couple of system pumps if needed. Twenty-eight twenty are going to be your two outputs that are going to be available with the startup wizard. So it's going to be one of your system pumps here, and then you're going to land your end switch here, and then uh, you're going to power this one fifty-seven plug uh, from your one, your forty plug here. So you're going to bring power from here over to here, and I'll show you that in the wiring uh, diagram coming up. So that's meaning this is what you're looking at. So now we're controlling uh, everything. We're controlling the operation of your domestic hot water tank and two system pumps as well. So that's where you would be landing your thermostats on ZC1, ZC2. And then that, that could be multiple zones and operating an end switch as you'll see coming up. Here's wiring that 2820 output here, or you can go into program and change it to different things as well. But as you'll see that we go through, uh, when we go through the startup wizard, uh, all of this stuff is pretty much done for you already. So here's wiring that 157 pump output. This is just something I cut out of the manual. I'm not the greatest artist. I just drew some wire diagrams here, but here's a better picture here. So on the 40 plug here, you're gonna come from your L from that 40 plug here, come down and bring it over to P, which is now gonna power this, the, uh, the relay. And then once that relay closes, you're gonna send that zero over and then that's now gonna power your pump. That's gonna be uh, brought over from your end switch or your um, T-stat, and that's what's gonna start the uh, uh, operation of your circulation. So normally when you are in the, uh, in the uh, classroom, I kind of give you the, a brief thing like this. I have all the wires disconnected on the boiler, and then we go out there and we get the wire them all. But for this example, this is what it looked like before. So we got our line voltage and just our 20 pump for now. Uh, so just remember that's their incoming power, which is your 40, and then that 20 pump output is going to be uh, your boiler pump. Once we wire it in, now you can see these little connectors here. You can feed your wire uh, through here. So it makes it uh, a nice, neat looking job. Most of the pitches I have people, and if you guys have nice pitches and you want to send them in, I, I put them in at the end of the presentations. But uh, 
they all uh, look like uh, works of art. So this is just a continuation of your work of art here. If you weren't using domestic, you could have uh, three pumps right out of the boiler. But if uh, you're using that domestic, you would have to end up getting one of our AM1 modules. AM1 modules so you can add more pumps for our boiler to see. And when I mean see, once you add that into our communication, it now knows it has an AM1. You have two more output pumps there, so you can do heating curves or fixed set points for two more pumps. This is what it looks like inside the box here. And then that, that 145 is going to go over to our 145 communication. It now knows that this has, once you start, and that's just a T stat wire. You have a little, uh, I'm not sure if that's mauve or what color that is, uh, uh, lavender. Uh, you, you plug that in and put your two thermostat wires, send that over to the uh, boiler to our 145 on there. It now knows that it has this in. And this is pretty similar with our mix. Excuse me, with our mixing valves as well. Looks almost exactly the same way. Uh, your pump goes in here as well, as well as your mixing uh, uh, information goes into here. And then the 145 goes over to the boiler. Same thing, once you uh, tie in that mixing valve, mixing valve, uh, the boiler now knows it has a mixing valve uh, into it. And these just plug into a wall socket. So it's not a, a lot of uh, wiring to do. So hopefully I'm not talking too fast and everybody's staying awake. And uh, I'm not sure if I'm talking the West Coast, East Coast, uh, Mid Coast, but please, uh, at this point, any question? Looks like there are no questions, Jay. Boy, I put them to sleep pretty early, Miranda. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just playing, hopefully I'm picking up some things here. We're having fun. I always like to throw that up because the way I learn is ask a lot of questions. We, we actually just got one if you want to answer it before we sure. move on. Can multiple T-stats be hooked to a single DE? Uh, no, you could put uh, like a zone control with uh, multiple zones on it and then run all your pumps and your, or, your circul uh, or your zone valves that way. You'll see as we're coming up, there's a little more on the wiring might answer that question to help you a little more too. All right, great. That's the only one that came in. Right. Great. Ask them guys, because that's the way I learned. Sometimes the teachers are telling me to be quiet. I ask too many questions, but hey, that's the way I learned. So here we go. So it, now you can see this one here happens to be a TACO zone control here. And as you can see, they're running uh, zone valves on this for this installation. And now you could have one more box over here doing another set of a bank of circulators and then send that end switch as well. So you can have multiples, up to three of these multiple boxes onto your boiler just uh, to, to show you how, what these boilers can do. So that means you could have three takeo boxes or whoever you want to use. Uh, that just happens because I can recognize it. Um, and then you can run separate. So, and then you're just sending uh, this end switch to DE1. And if you had another one, you could send that over to DE2. And then if you had one more, you could send that over to DE3 and have one with a fixed set point and two modulating to the outdoor temperature. So that's what we're saying. That's what separates us. So we can do a lot of things with these boilers. It's just helpful to know all the different things that they do. But that's why you guys are coming to the webinars and I appreciate it. So you can either do a fixed set point this way or weather compensated. Remember weather compensated, you're gonna have that outdoor uh, control. You have to have your outdoor control on this boiler anyways. And with all the rebates driving the sales of these boilers in most areas, uh, that's what they're looking for is some type of outdoor reset control to make these boilers more efficient, to make them energy efficient. This one here, just showing you just um, another option. And now you could have added this to the uh, other side. This one here is uh, just uh, using all pumps and sending the end switch over to the boiler. All your T stats go into the one control and then you're sending the end switch over. That prior picture here, you could have had that one plus that one and send the uh, end switches over. So that could be DE1 or DE2 or DE3. 
three, either a fixed set point or a weather compensated. I'm a weather compensation person. Uh, I've been doing it for uh, quite a long time. About the time uh, U.S. started thinking about it, I was already had it going uh, because Wiesman was well advanced in the day when they first came into the U.S. And they were well advanced on all of this stuff here because just imagine what the fuel bills uh, they're paying in Europe compared to what we pay here. It's about three times more. So if you looked at your fuel bill today and times that times three, now you know why you have to become more efficient with your systems and why their maximum temperature is only 167 degrees in Germany. So now you can see here, we have three different temperatures going right to the boiler here. So we have one high temp on ZC1, one medium temp, let's say on ZC2, and then uh, one low temp on ZC3. This one here, we just happen to use uh, thermatic mixing valves. If you use our mixing valves, they actually have a control box like this AM1 module, but it's for our mixing valves. That plugs into the wall as well, which will now control this pump. It has a strap on uh, a sensor on there so you can check the temperatures going out to your mix temperatures, as well as it's constantly modulating uh, to the proper temperature with our mixing valves. So normally with uh, these also have, uh, the sensors actually uh, tie right into the control box. And uh, the, right built into the sensor is a worm gear. You wrap it around the pipe and then uh, just tighten it up. It's in, so you've got to take the cover off to see that worm gear. I've had calls on that before. Uh, so uh, when I first started putting a lot of the instructions weren't quite in English yet either as well. So it, and it was always Celsius. Showing the other things that you can send over to the boiler as well. BMS. Your zero to 10 outputs or uh, taking different voltages. Uh, just make sure they are polarity sensitive uh, on uh, zero to tens. So that means you could have your minus to your minus plus to plus. Just showing you how a zero to 10 works with one volt, uh, two volts, three volts, and so forth, and what temperatures you're going to achieve going up the ladder here as you add a bolt to the system. Sometimes I used to have people just check with a nine volt battery uh, and then you can just uh, make sure everything's operating. Of course, it's gonna shoot right up to temperature there, but uh, we're just checking to make sure everything's operational. Just make sure you check polarity. That's been issues as well. Minus to minus, plus to plus. A one to one, two to two. Looking at our sensors just a little bit here and what's operating the boilers. The AHL, as you can see, that's our boiler operating temperature sensor. That's this, uh, what we call our number three sensor. And that's the same, like I said, on all our boilers, our number three sensor. That's a 10,000 K ohms resistor, NTC. And then right next to that up here is our fixed high limit. This is a wet well. To replace that, you gotta pull that clip out. Uh, we have ohms test for these. So if it does uh, fail in ohms reading, uh, looking at the charts in the manual, service manual, uh, then you would uh, replace that, drop your pressures, and then just pull that clip out. Uh, make sure you do shut your water off and drain it correctly. Your uh, fixed high limit is a, a fixed uh, sensor. So that's just the, like a strap on it's uh, adhered to the pipe. Uh, and that's gonna uh, shut the boiler down at 210 degrees once it's achieved. <coughs> Excuse me. On the larger models, they actually have a two, uh, number three sensors, a 3A and a 3B. They're constantly checking each other. And uh, if they happen to drift two degrees apart from each other, you will get a fault. It's a double uh, redundancy there. On the smaller uh, Vito dens, the 94 up to the 352 have flow switches. So that paddle gets activated once that pump comes on and activates flow. So when you're looking at our flow switch inside the boiler here, 
Uh, I always tell people when you know it's incorrectly, the brown wires are facing you this way. There's an arrow on the top that's pointing down. Our flows come out of the top of the boiler and down. So our returns are on the right-hand side. Our supplies are coming out on the left-hand side. It's a, it's a thumb screw, basically. You can, uh, during your maintenance, I usually say, you know, drop your pressures to clean it. Paddles get a little dirty. On the larger boilers, the 399 to the 530s, uh, they're ultrasonic flow sensors. Uh, these do the same thing, uh, different location. Uh, they're on the back left-hand corner of the boiler. Uh, these, uh, same thing. If they drift off two degrees, uh, you will get a fault. Uh, these are uh, flow sensors. Uh, you can go into the control and actually read your flows on, this, on your larger boilers here. Two screws hold them on. If you do have to replace those, uh, recommendation, pull the burner. It's only eight uh, hex head screws, uh, a couple of nuts on the gas valve. You can pull the burner out of your way. One screw on the gas valve, pull that out of the way, and then you can get to these pretty easy. That's a matter of maybe five minutes. Make your life easier. A flue gas temperature sensor. If that hits two, 230. That will pop, and that's usually the, uh, the, all these sensors are to protect us fuel pipe coming off the top of these boilers, because all these uh, boilers are doing polypropylene, CPVC, so uh, they have uh, temperature limits. So that's why we have a lot of safeties on these boilers. Your fluid temperature sensor is typically anywhere from four to 27 degrees above your boiler water return temperature. Looking at a boiler room here. This is a picture somebody sent in. Nice looking installation here. This is an HB, so this is a smaller residential. There's another nice looking job here. Now you can see all the different types of applications. This is a, uh, a nice way uh, to display all your different ways of different temperatures here. So we got uh, one zone control here. We have another one over here. We have our mixing valve over here. There's our uh, mixing valve. So they have radiant here as well, as well as they have an indirect storage tank over here. So now you, this job here, they're controlling everything from the boiler. So we did go over our line voltage, our low voltage sensor connections and our numbering system. So like I said, once you learn the numbering system, you'll realize, you know, it gets, makes life easier once you work with them more, as well as the sensors. As sent nice thing with the sensors, they are auto-recognized. The bad thing about the sensors, they're not auto-recognized, and it's not really a bad thing, because once we get into programming coming up here, you'll see it's easy to take them out. All the different functions out of our boiler uh, kind of separate us with auto recognition. Lambda Pro, there's a lot of different things that separate us uh, from others. A heat exchanger as well. Flow stitches, remember the paddle switches as well as ultrasonic uh, flow sensors. And then the low water cutoff, you can either uh, tie it into your 40 plug or your multi plug. And that's your incoming power or your uh, multi plug is uh, designed uh, for uh, switches. So make sure you're getting your information you come for. So ask questions. Looks like you covered everything they needed to know about wiring. Oh, moly. <laughs> All right, well. Hopefully you picked up some couple things here and there to help you out. So now we're gonna talk about a little bit about the programming of the boiler as well. So we're gonna go over the uh, uh, HO1B control on this boiler here. Uh, this does not have a touch screen. So we have up, down, left, right buttons on this boiler here as well. We'll go over the symbols, what they mean. 
go over what the importance of correct times and dates on the control are. Uh, when you first start up this uh, startup with it, it's one of the first questions that I'd ask you is set the time and date. I highly recommend uh, setting the time and date because this boiler has fault codes with time and dates as well as that we have a lot of different time programs on this boiler. So if you want it to work correctly on the right day and time, uh, then uh, it's pretty simple. You'll see the setup. We'll go over the two different types of temperature controls when utilizing the startup wizard. We'll go over some heating curve adjustments as well and how they work on this boiler here. All right. so. If you guys need toothpicks or anything like that to keep the eyes open, they're sitting right here on my desk. All right, so we're talking about the Vitatronic 200 HO1B control. So what I was talking about before, these two doors will slide left and right. So there's your on and uh, off button on the very right hand side. So once you slide this door over to the uh, right hand side, uh, you'll see your on and off button. Once you slide this door here to the left, here's our reset button. Here's our pressure reading in bars, uh, which they actually give you a temperature and pressure gauge manual that you would put in your piping. Uh, as well as this V here, green is operational, red means your fault, but those are actually uh, op optolinks. And we sell a device that uh, for the homeowner that, that plugs into this V here. There's a cutout down here where you slide your USB to the back to uh, a product that we sell called Vito Connect. And that's for the homeowner to make any um, temperature changes uh, on their domestic or on a thermostat or uh, things to that nature. They cannot get into programming or do anything else uh, with that, uh, but uh, things to that on their apps on their phone. Uh, the new apps that are coming out on the new generation boilers, they're going to be for the contractor. Some neat stuff coming up. So looking at the buttons on the control, so the very bottom starting with that is your menu key. The one up from there, the question mark. So if you're looking at something on the screen and they, uh, you want a little explanation on some of the things, you hit that question mark, it will give you a brief explanation of what you're looking at. Okay, uh, that stands for anytime you make a change or a programming change or a coding change, Make sure you hit OK so it acknowledges, accept it, so it will store it. The navigation up, down, left, right buttons. And then the return to the previous screen is that U uh, arrow uh, pointing left. So it's a hard one to describe over the phone. So I always, uh, when you come to the class, I always like to start with this when you have your handhelds in front of you. Up to about two and a half years ago, all our boilers came in German. So you would have to go in there, take them out of German, put them into English. Uh, me speaking no German at all, I would walk you through by telling you to hit the menu button, which is those three lines on the bottom. Then uh, once that menu button comes up, scroll all the way down until you see the gears. Once you see the gears, that's Einstelagen. I'm not even know if I'm saying that correctly. But uh, that's settings in English, and then settings in the English, now you can find your language, which in German is Sprech or Sprechen, I'm not sure. All my uh, German, I was taught from uh, Hogan's Heroes, so I'm not a, uh, speak very fluent German. So that's where you would go to change the language. And once you uh, put it into English, now you were into the settings screen still. That's where you would have to change your time and date as well as uh, Celsius to Fahrenheit, all in that same setting screen. But that's all changed now. Uh, we have American engineers designing boilers for American uh, contractors to make life easier here in the US. So looking at that menu, <clears throat> when we hit that menu button, all your subscreens will come up and then you're gonna uh, choose and uh, this stuff's not gonna come up. These submenus here are going to come up. And then as you pick each one, these submenus will come up to see all the different things. Uh, we'll start with the settings. So remember, if uh, you have a prior model and you change out the control and you want to put it back into English, we're going to hit that menu button. Scroll down till we see the gears, that's settings. And then change our language. That's where it would stay, Einstein, 
and then settings, and then we're gonna go into language, that would be Sprig, and then change it to English. And now it says American English for years, it was British English. So whatever they got, we got. So hitting that setting ones on the very bottom, what you're looking at is where you're gonna set your time of date, your language, your light, uh, your contrast of the screen, the brightness, temperature of units, that's Celsius or Fahrenheit, where you can actually name your heating circuits. Uh, here, where you be naming it, where it be main uh, section of the house, whatever you want to call it, kitchen, whatever. Uh, main menu, that's bringing you back, and then factory default setting is just uh, bringing you back to some factory defaults. If you hit that information button, it's a nice little quick button to hit. Uh, it's going to give you like your, if you hit the one on general, it's going to tell you what your outdoor temperature is at that time, what your boiler temperature is, and things to that nature, uh, like burn run cycles, things to that. So we're just showing you now the old way. And as you can see here in the, the newer style control, if you're doing the startup wizard, uh, and you're not doing constant circulation. This is the older style here, where you have a house here representing a house, and then that's your room temperature set point there. You'll see coming up, the startup wizard has changed to a different symbol. Now, if we go into the menu, hit that heating on menu. Here's your subscreen for the heating. And that's the first one everybody usually asks is, what the heck is party mode? It's not like we're big drinkers. Maybe now that I'm home, I, I become a big drinker. Just kidding. But uh, heating a uh, party mode, what that is, is uh, we have uh, different types of setback uh, controls on this boiler, meaning that uh, just like a light setback thermostat, you can do that with the boiler. So if you're doing like constant circulation and uh, you have a room temperature set point, say of 70 degrees, and at night uh, you put your reduced temperature down to 68 degrees, uh, at once it hits that time of night, it will reduce. Um, but in this case, you're having a party. And at nine o'clock at night, it starts to go into its reduced mode, as well as your domestic can go in a reduced mode. So you still have guests at your house. You don't want them to get cold. You still want to have hot water. So you would hit that party mode button and it would last for about eight hours and maintain regular operation. After eight hours, it would go back into the uh, economy mode which leads me into the next one, which is economy mode. And economy mode is forcing it uh, the opposite. So instead of taking it out of economy mode, this is putting it into economy mode. So if you have a, a reduced temperature that you want to go to and you're leaving or you want to do this on your phone, you hit that economy mode for eight hours, it will put it into the reduced mode. The next one down, room temperature set point. That's uh, to achieve the room temperature set point that you're trying to achieve when you're doing constant circulation, excuse me. Uh, that means uh, like in my house here, I have no thermostats in my house. So that room temperature set point would be my thermostat for my whole house. I do constant circulation and modulates to the outdoor temperature. It's constantly checking my mixing valve outlet temperatures as well as my low loss header sensors. Uh, so it's achieving uh, to my heat loss as well as my uh, heat demand. The next one down is uh, exactly that. So the red room is not that you have a red room, it's a reduced temperature. So that means if at nighttime, uh, you wanna reduce the temperature by using a room, uh, a time program, this is where you would go from, so whatever you set at your room temperature set point, say 70 degrees there, and then at nighttime, you wanna drop down to say 68 degrees, that's where you would do that. And then uh, it would go, and then you would have to set your time programs up for your um, heat time programs. Uh, your operating uh, programs, that's depending on what you're doing, heating or domestic, domestic only, or standby mode. You're gonna find uh, when you do uh, the startup wizard, uh, it's gonna put you in standby because now it's usually waiting for some type of call from an end switch or a thermostat. Here, remember, we're doing constant circulation. It's a little different. And I was doing constant circulation uh, 
uh, just about 30 years ago. So it's a little different than having an on and off switch of the thermostat. The hardest thing I found doing that type of installation was with my house anyways, was telling my wife we have no thermostats to operate from the world. Next one down, heating time program. That's where you're gonna put any type of heating time program, just like a night setback. It can do four, four times a day on and off, as well as uh, seven days a week. The next one down, holiday program. Holiday uh, in Germany is vacation here in the US. So if you're going on a vacation and you want to reduce all your temperatures, uh, the day you're leaving, you put that time and date that you're leaving. And then uh, before you get home, you put the time and date that you want it to come back on. These are good for summer homes as well as they can use this with that phone app. So if they have summer or winter homes, they can activate all this stuff and get it to work uh, right from their phone. Lastly there, uh, heating curves. Uh, if you're doing constant circulation, you've got to come in here and do your heating curves here. Whereas you'll see coming up when you're doing it in the startup uh, with the startup wizard uh, running using a thermostat to modulate to the outdoor temperature. Uh, we're going to do that right at the startup. And then if you had to make any readjustments, this is where you would come to. On our uh, uh, heating curves, we have a slope as well as a shift. Just notice that uh, on the slope there, uh, all our boilers are always come here uh, defaulted at 1.4. And when I first started, that's all you got out of these boilers was 167 degrees. So at 1.4, that's max temperature in Germany. So they cannot exceed 167 degrees. Here we were trained, uh, you know, 180, uh, where we could still heat houses with a lot lower temperature. Uh, Excuse me, as well as a shift, a uh, parallel shift. We'll go over that a little bit. And uh, the shift there, uh, that stands for a zero Kelvin, not okay. I always thought it was okay. Uh, when they asked me what my shift was, I would say, oh, it's okay. But that's a shift, uh, so that's zero Kelvin. That's how they uh, measure energy. All right, so now we're looking at our uh, shift here. So remember, 167 was our max temperature. So if you want uh, higher temperatures, this boiler does go to 180. The larger ones to 185. Uh, I normally set my heating curves to the coldest day of the year, whatever your coldest day of the year is, uh, to my warm weather shutdown. A shift, what you're doing at the uh, with a shift uh, is uh, you're lowering or raising the lower end of the scale. Remember our warm weather shutdown is usually two degrees higher than our uh, room set point, which you can actually change in coding to make it different times or different temperatures. Uh, but you're, what you're doing, and the way I always explain that, say a warm weather shutdown at 68 degrees is too cold for the elderly. I always like to use my mom for an example because she is 86 and she likes to keep her thermostat at 86. Uh, so with those warm weather shutdowns, I would go in there and make a shift upwards and get warmer temperatures at the lower end of the scales. So they're not calling you saying I'm cold when it's warmer out. Outdoor reset, and why, why use it? I like that last one there, keep up, not catch up because we have always have those people that want to turn the thermostat uh, before they go to work down to 60 and then come home and then put it up to 80. And then they're wondering why we're playing catch up. A lot of times it's not the boiler, it's how, many, how much emitter, uh, emitters you have in your house. If you don't have enough emitters, it's never gonna catch up and it's always gonna be the boiler's fault. That's where a heat loss calculation uh, should be done prior to putting these boilers to make sure you have enough heat emitters uh, to run at lower temperatures to get these boilers to condense. Remember, we want a return temperature of about 130, 135. 
uh, to get these boilers to condense to maintain that 95, 97% efficiency. We're not condensing, we're always in that 180 mark. Well, guess what? We're not in those 90s. We're in the high to low, low 90s on our efficiency. Uh, what we're trying to do is before that condensate use uh, as a gas form uh, out the heat exchanger, we're trying to grab about uh, 8,000 BTUs per gallon out of that condensate. So we're trying to grab every little bit of heat before it leaves the boiler. So that's what's making that boiler efficient. I like longer run cycles, uh, longer, uh, uh, less fluctuation of your temperatures. Uh, ways to get around with constant circulation is uh, they can have a thermostat. I, normally I would have them have, it. they can have them. I just wouldn't send an end switch over to the boiler and I would set my room temperature set point a um, couple degrees lower than I would have my thermostats upstairs. So it would run, have longer run cycles that way. Thermostats are still gonna shut your pumps off or whatnot, um, but it's just another way of looking at it. These are the things that we should know and what to look at. The design day parameters. What was the house designed for originally, maybe? Or if you're doing a new house, you want to do whatever your states uh, uh, require. What type of emitters are you using or what temperatures are you going to uh, supply to them? If you ever look at people's baseboards, uh, uh, manufacturer's baseboard charts, if you ever look at them, you can design a house. Their temperatures go down to 118. So you can heat a house with 118. You can have a lot of baseboard in the house but uh, you can save a lot of money that way. What's in the construction of the building? How much insulation? All that comes into factor. And then the customer needs, uh, what, that, what is that? Who's living in the house? Remember the elderly don't sense the temperature as well as the younger people. It's just a, it's a scientific fact. Uh, less moisture uh, in the skin to sense the temperature. Uh, adding moisture to, uh, to uh, elderly's house will help them sense temperature better. So let's talk about our heating curves and how do they work. One, you staying awake out there? All right, just playing. So let's go over our heating curves and how they work. Looking at our chart in the manual, which is one in the manual, and that be in your service manual. And that uh, in the very beginning, that pull login, uh, if you can't find the manual on a job site, it's a nice place to go find it. Uh, it. It gives you all your current manuals, quick and easy to get to. And then you can actually download it to your phone before you even get out there in case you don't have Wi-Fi. All right, so looking at on the right-hand side of our chart, we have our boiler water temperature. Down here below, we have our outdoor temperature here. Just make sure what you, if you're looking at uh, your temp boiler water temperature on the chart, you're looking at Fahrenheit and not Celsius. Same there with your outdoor temperature. So just for an example on this case here, today we're gonna choose a 1.0 heating curve. And uh, the way I explain our heating curves, how that works is okay, outdoor temperature just dropped one degree outside. Now our boiler temperature is gonna go up one degree. One degree outside, one degree inside on a 1.0 heating curve. If we had a 2.6 heating curve, let's say for an example, we just dropped one degree outside and now our boiler temperature goes up 2.6 degrees. So that's how our heating curves will adjust up and down according to the outdoor temperature. So it's always constantly checking that you can actually change how fast the outdoor temperature responds to the boiler. In some cases, you don't want it to respond as quick. In other cases, you might want it to respond a little quicker. Now the temperature doesn't change all that dramatically all the time. So in this situation, outdoor temperatures change, so won't the temperatures in the boiler. So as you can see, just as an example, at minus four outside, we go up that chart now, we go up, follow it over, and then take a look at the chart. We now see that that boiler at minus four is going to be running at about 140 degrees. 
once it hits 23 degrees outside, we follow that shot up to the line, go across, and now see that that day when we're now heating the house with 122 degree water temperature. Once it hits 50 degree, now you can see we're heating the house with 95 degree water temperature, which is in most cases, that's what I'm heating my house with. I have a lot of radiant in my house. Uh, uh, my heating curve uh, for my radiant end floor is about 0 0.4. My high temp, I'm at about uh, 0 0.8, and that's with rental radiators. So for this example, you can now see uh, anywhere from 70 uh, to 140, we're ranging out up and down the scale between the different temperature. So we modulate up and down that red line here with according to the outdoor temperatures and then we're modulating our temperatures in our boiler. This is just to show you an example without the lines here. So now at this uh, selected 1.6 heating curve, we look at that minus four on that day, we're now heating at, at minus four at 180 degrees. Once we get to 23 degrees, we're now heating the house with 149 and then so forth, 50 degrees, 113. And that's at a 68 degree room temperature set, set point. So now that range with that heating curve is now anywhere from 70 degrees to 180 degrees. So we're, we're uh, going up and down that scale. But my example here is how often are you at your coldest day a year? Maybe in Alaska, you're there every single day and still there. I think uh, they just went, went through spring breakup. I used to actually live in Alaska and I have a brother and sister that lived there. Um, and so we were waiting for that tower to go down on the, the, the river. They, it's one of the biggest pools they have in Alaska is they have these tripods set up on the river. And then when spring breakup comes, whoever has the closest time and date wins the pool. Pretty fascinating to watch as well. So let's go over the, uh, the, in our manual here, we have these starting points for your heating curves. So depending on what your, uh, your charts are, uh, A, B, or C. So now you can see A uh, is usually gonna be your lower temperatures, your radiant floor, uh, things to that nature in Florida where you need low temperatures. Medium temperatures could be cast iron radiators, rental radiators. And remember, these are just starting points. You might have to uh, tweak them here and there for your, uh, your heating curves. Hydro air, uh, maybe a double pass coil, high, out, high, high output temperatures, fan coils, things of that nature. So now we can see that ABC still here. Now we've got it up near the, our chart. You see the ABC. So these are starting points. And to me, it's not starting points for, it's for the person that's living in the house and what their comfort level wants to be. Uh, so uh, that's why I would always add in a couple of calls to my installations uh, and uh, inform the homeowner that yes, I might have to come out here and adjust your heating curves maybe once uh, to your comfort level, maybe even twice, or I can have you go down there and show you, you know, just bump up your room temperature set point and that will actually bump your heating curves till I can get out there and adjust your heating curves. Remember, that's just your up or down arrow on the front screen when you're in the main screen. Your domestic set points, as we're still looking at that menu, that's that three line bar at the very bottom of that up, down, left, right uh, control part of it. Uh, here's where you're gonna make your domestic water temperature changes. Uh, your set points are here. Uh, remember, we can do a DHW time program, meaning, hey, at 10 o'clock at night, I want my DHW to go down, uh, shut off, or reduce. The other neat thing is there's your DHW circ recirculation time program, meaning uh, you're doing recirculation, you're recirculating domestic around the house, and so they open it up their faucet and they're getting hot water. So that can save you some money right there by uh, buying a lesser pump, uh, still be able to handle the uh, domestic water, but you don't need that time program, uh, push pin uh, programming on that pump. You can just use the time program in the, in the boiler itself. The test button mode, uh, that's a nice little feature as well. You come in here, you hit, that th hit the three lines on the bottom, scroll down to that test mode, you hit okay, 
it will fire the boiler up to limit just to see if everything's uh, uh, working as well as all your pumps will come on. If you wanna see any information in zone circuits as well, uh, that's where you're gonna see it. So your default set point for this boiler here is 122. If you want a, hot, a hotter water than that, I normally would get a signature as well as having a mixing valve on the boiler. Uh, but this boiler can uh, achieve 140 degree water temperature going over uh, to your indirect will be a uh, different temperature. But that sensor will shut off uh, whatever temperature you put in here. And your max temperature is limited by your coding card. So there's no changes that are going beyond the, uh, the max, you can't. So with a domestic set point, remember if you do a heating time program and you leave it here, so when you first get over to, before you get into here, you're gonna see that uh, We're going to see that uh, it's going to ask you automatic or individual before you even get into the time program. What automatic is, it's automatically, so if you have a heat time program, it's automatically going to, your domestic time program is going to follow that automatically. When you get to this point, if you want to put it in individual, your heat time program is going to have its own time program and your domestic is going to have its own time program. If you're not doing a heat time program and you just want to do a domestic time program. You would come in here, you can put uh, four different times on and off a day, seven days a week. Same with your recirculation as well. You can do the same thing. Information, this is a nice little thing uh, for a quick helpful hint. Uh, to see what, how operation is going. If you click OK on that general, hit the information button, hit OK on general, that's going to give uh, your, your outdoor temperatures uh, and just uh, basic information, what's boiler temperature, uh, how many run cycles, things of that nature. So it's got a lot of little helpful things in there. Uh, just a quick look. Any other changes? Remember, if you don't have this stuff tied in, domestic, solar, you're not going to see any of that. No programming. Inside is programming as well. So here's what you're gonna see when you do hit that general. So you can see your outdoor temperatures, your burners, run cycles, fuel consumption, uh, is your pump on or off? So here's where you can check uh, different things here. Now let's start with the wizard a little bit here. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's only if you have this wizard symbol on the side of the boiler or on the uh, boiler box when you get it, do you have this wizard control feature. You can upgrade the prior models to this feature, but what's that mean? That means a control, this interface here, as well as a coding card. I'm not sure what the cost is on that, uh, but uh, you can upgrade the older ones to get the startup wizard. So when you first initially power up the startup wizard, this is what you're gonna to see to the left, is that bar go across. I mean, it's, just, it's checking the safety times and checking and then uh, it's booting up. This is the very first time you start this boiler with the startup wizard. Next thing it's gonna ask you, do you wanna keep it in American English? If so, hit okay. Next thing it's gonna ask you, is set your time and date. Remember, the two important things to set your time and date is that the boiler has fault codes that set time and date. I will give you time and date when things happen. So if the homeowner went down and hit the reset button, she couldn't remember what the um, fault was, you go here and uh, go into your fault codes and you'll see uh, what day and what time it happened. That's good for people adding generators and not upgrading their gas piping. I found issues that way as well as incoming power to the house at eight o'clock at night, for some reason we were losing power to our boiler. So a little helpful tool. Next thing you're gonna do is, do you wanna keep it in Fahrenheit? Hit okay. Next thing, it asks you uh, uh, such a domestic uh, temperature. So 
But if you don't have that number five sensor, you bypass that part and go right to the next section. So only when you have your number five domestic sensor tied to the boiler will it uh, show you to uh, adjust your temperatures. And that's where you're gonna adjust your DHW or your domestic cut water temperatures right here. Next thing, if you're doing a constant circulation, you're gonna hit no zone circuits. Uh, once you do that, you'll see this screen here. So remember, prior way, constant circulation, you'll have the house in the screen. Uh, inside the screen, remember, is your room temperature set point. And if you want to bump up your heating curves, uh, when you're in the screen, just hit your up and down arrow, and it will automatically adjust that room temperature set point. As you can see in the screen, we have HC1. So that's for heating circuits. So that's the prior way constant circulation. The new zone circuit control, this is what's gonna come up if you pick zone circuits. So that one, two, three on, on there. As you can see now, we went from a heating circuit that was in this corner now to a ZC2 uh, circuit. So that means that right now displaying is that zone circuit two. As you can see, there's a radiator in there. We still have our outdoor temperature hooked up and now we're at 165 degree uh, boiler water temperature. So that means that this one here, zone circuit two, is running on an outdoor reset because if we were at a fixed set point, we would not see that outdoor temperature. And remember, you can, in examples coming up, we're gonna show you that you can do both. So for this example here, we're gonna do uh, two zone circuits. First one we're gonna pick for zone circuit one, for an example, we're gonna pick a fixed set point just to show you how everything works. Fixed set point, next thing I'd ask you, okay, adjust your fixed set point. What temperature do you wanna to go to? Do I wanna stay here at 165? Do I wanna maintain at 185? That's your maintaining. Remember, this is gonna make it like a cold stop boiler. So whatever you put in there, that's what it's gonna maintain. Next thing it's gonna ask you is pick a pump output. And that's what that stands for, either the 2820 output or your 157 output, or if you wanna add more pumps to it, uh, that's where you're gonna add them uh, uh, with that AM1 module output. That's an add-on. But as soon as you plug that in through our 145 communication, and now knows has, it has that hooked up, and now you can add two more pumps to our boiler and do all the controlling out of the boiler itself. So for this example here, we're gonna pick the 2820 uh, pump output. So that's uh, our zone circuit one. We have a fixed set point. We pick fixed set point over here. Next thing we set our temperature and the next thing we picked our pump output or a circ uh, pump output here. Hit okay. Next thing is okay, that one's set up. Let's do zone circuit two now. So now we're on zone circuit two. For this example on zone circuit two, we'll pick weather compensation or weather compensated. Once we pick that, we hit okay. We now, uh, it's asking us to set up our heating curve and our shift. So slope and shift. Remember while you're making your, uh, if you're doing any shifting down here, that's adjusting your slope. So if you do a shift, go back and readjust your, uh, your slope because it will adjust with your shift. That's raising lower the lower end, uh, lower end, but it also does that at the same time. So just go back to your slope and raise and lower that. Once you hit okay on that, next thing it's gonna ask you is pick the pump output for that zone circuit two. Remember that 157 pump output is a dry contact. We're gonna power it from that 40 plug like I was showing you earlier and wiring. And here's just a quick video I grabbed out of our video library and our Academy website. So any of these videos or even this uh, webinar that I'm doing today uh, will be posted on our Academy website. So if you wanna uh, re-listen to mine or watch these videos that uh, Mo uh, in our uh, tech support has done, he's done a phenomenal job on them. Even with some of our prior models, he's got some stuff up there as well. And uh, it's very helpful. So we watch this one here. Hey, 
look at it this way, you get to see the sports. Start by selecting your desired language. Next, set the time and date. The time is in the 24 hour format. The date is a month, day, year format. The next step is to select your temperature unit. For this example, we'll select Fahrenheit. At the zone circuit settings screen, select the number of zone circuits you will be connecting to your boiler. For this example, we will be selecting two zone circuits. For zone circuit one, we will select a fixed set point setting. Under the temperature set point screen, set your target temperature. Under the output configuration screen, select the desired pump output for the zone circuit. For zone circuit two, we will select weather compensated functionality. Under the heating curve screen, make the necessary adjustments to the slope and shift to achieve the desired heating curve. Next, you can select the desired pump output for the zone circuit. The zone circuit settings screen summarizes your selections. Continue with OK, and the startup is now complete. So, you can see it's pretty simple to set this up. And remember, you can always restart the startup course if, uh, if you make any mistakes. In the outlook. That's coming up. We'll show you how to do that as well. But before we move on, First question, if you set a room or zone temperature to 70 degrees, 72 degrees Fahrenheit, but the boiler temp is set for only 70 degrees, can you achieve the 72 degrees Fahrenheit? I really don't want to go to 72 degrees. It's only going to maintain the 70 that I, I have on the boiler. To me, that right now is the way I always said that now is uh, the thermostat will now become kind of like a high limit, basically. And then my control is all done with, with the boiler itself to maintain 70. Whatever they're trying to achieve in their living area, I would always go two degrees higher on my thermostat. And then just do constant circulation more so uh, to achieve uh, constant circulation as well as uh, temperature. Can you use an additional indoor sensor for room influence while using weather compensation? We do. We have a, what is called a Vita Troll. Uh, the uh, Vita Troll looks just like that control on the boiler, but you put it up in the living area. Uh, that will do, uh, the Vita Troll 300 will give you some room feedback, as well as there's an extension to that as well, where you can run another thermostat wire to another sensor into another room. So it's a little uh, wiring involved. Uh, the new ones hopefully will be wireless as well as a wireless outdoor sensor. I know they've had wireless in Germany for years now, which I've been trying to strive for, and I'm pretty sure that's coming very soon. Can you show a wiring example where the pump for the DHW is on the other side of the low loss header? A wiring is example, did you say? Yes, um, a wiring example where the pump for the DHW is on the other side of the low loss header. It would still get wired into that same, um, same spot that's still in that 21 spot. It's just when we go into programming, and that's coming up here, I'm gonna show you in a couple of minutes. Uh, when you have it on the other side, all you're doing is, um, telling the boiler itself, okay, I'm not on the boiler side, I'm now on the other side. So we'll activate that pump underneath the boiler now to keep that low loss header hot. So uh, that temperature will go up to your uh, domestic. You'll see when I'm coming up, but let me just go, uh, I have a picture here just to show you something. Let me just go back to that real quick here.
So that pump would be over on the other side over here now. You're still gonna wire it to that 21 spot that I showed you earlier in the wiring diagram. It's just not gonna be on this side. So what happens is when you go into the, the domestic, if you have it on this side here, this pump shuts off. When that pump shuts off, this pump takes over, actuates the flow switch through here, and then maintains temperature to whatever you've got on your domestic set point. If you have this pump on this side over here, what that uh, 5B does is it activates this pump here. So this pump now comes on, activates the flow switch, and maintains your domestic through here and going out to your domestic. Uh, so that's the only difference is a programming change. You're still going to wire that uh, your domestic pump to the 21. It's just a programming change. And that's coming up uh, in this uh, next half of the uh, presentation. And that was the last question, Jay. Good questions, keep them coming. All right, so moving on. So now we're gonna look at some of the symbols, what they mean on the front of the boiler. So now, as you can see, uh, this one here, we got that uh, half moon or round circle in the thing. So we're now we're in zone circuits. Remember, if we have the house in the screen, that's uh, no zone circuits, we're doing the older way of uh, constant circulation with no end switches. Here, what we can see is zone circuit two, as well as we're in the heat operation. So that means the radiator is on. So that's telling us that we are in the heat mode and the pump is running. So that circle with the triangle in there means the pump is running. Outside here is your outdoor temperature. Current operating uh, temperature is inside the screen. We're now running at about 54% on the operation, uh, output rather, and then, uh, if that is illuminated, that means your burner is uh, operating. ZC1, same thing. Now you can see there's no outdoor temperature, but our radiator is up in the screen, our pump is calling, our boiler is firing. We're at 54%, but that means uh, no outdoor temperature means we have a fixed set point. So we're not modulating to an outdoor temperature here. Uh, so uh, we're just running to a set point. If you want information on your uh, zone circuits, uh, you would look here. That's if you tie in your end switches. If we're doing HC or heating circuits, remember now we see the house in the screen. Up in the top left-hand corner, you're gonna see a faucet and a radiator. If you're doing a ZC functionality, let's see if that shows that here. This normally gets put into a standby mode. So you'll see standby mode up here and then ZC instead of HC. So you will see the standby mode here when you're doing um, ZC instead of HC because when you do ZC, they're waiting for an, a call for an end switch. So if you're doing ZC, you're gonna have an end switch going over to the boiler. That's what's gonna activate uh, either your thermostat's gonna activate and modulate to the outdoor temperature or your thermostat's gonna activate the boiler and go to a fixed set point. Same things in here, but this is just a little different of operation up and down uh, as the room temperature set point. To get into zone circuits, hit the menu key. And then uh, just to see different uh, temperatures and what to achieve uh, with different uh, heating circuits or zone circuits, I'm sorry. Uh, so we have uh, zone circuit one, zone circuit two, and zone circuit three. And we're running, uh, you might run three different heating curves off of that. So with zone circuit one, as you can see, we have a much higher temperature. So on that minus four degree day, uh, we're gonna achieve about 180 degree water temperature. On zone circuit two, we have a 1.2 heating curve. Now on that day there, uh, we might be about 153 degree water temperature. So that could be a mid-range uh, rad, uh, constant circulation rads or uh, low temp, uh, medium temp rads. 
tone circuitry, we're obviously doing some type of uh, snow melt or uh, M4 at 0 0.6. Just to show you the different adjustments uh, to change your different uh, for different conditions in the house, or who's living in the house, different sections of the house, how much radiation do they have in the house. Service menu is a really nice menu to go into to do troubleshooting as well, which we offer our troubleshooting. Uh, we have uh, switch boxes that we can create faults on the boiler. We actually call, uh, create faults and then you fix the boiler. Just a nice little way to get some hands on when you come to the academy. So accessing that service menu, we're gonna press OK and the menu key both at the same time for about five seconds. After that five seconds, you'll see the screen change and then you'll see the service menu uh, highlighted on the top here. And we're gonna scroll down to serv service functions. Here's where you can see your fault history here. So if you wanna look at your last top 10 faults, or you would go there. So remember to get into that, that's in the service function. Um, service menu, I'm sorry, uh, right before you get into service functions. You hit okay on that, uh, it will show you that uh, your last top 10 faults. It will display each fault, what they were, and give you the time and date that they happened. So you can do some troubleshooting with that uh, fault history as well. Service function, once you do that, uh, this will come up here. You get into that service function, you have your diagnosis, which will be the first one. So uh, it's like that uh, information uh, one that you go to, but it's gonna give you your actuals and set points. So you can make sure everything's jiving, your outdoor temperature and your, your, your what's coming into the boilers uh, accurate, your temperatures on your low loss header sensors are accurate, things to that nature, your DHW. So you can check all your actuals and set points. Sometimes they say you had a, a domestic sensor go bad and you go here and take a look at your actuals and set points and then if you're not achieving, it could be that your air bound as well. Uh, uh, your pump went bad, so why aren't I coming out of domestic? So just, a, you know, things to look at temperature wise. Going into that service function at the very bottom here, you can do a participant check if, so if you're doing multiple boilers, service pins, uh, that I recommend looking at the manual. Uh, service reset, uh, that's just to go back to the service. Filling and venting, if you didn't know that these were here. Filling is when you're filling the boiler, it actually exercises the pump for 30 minutes to help fill the boiler and help push the air out. Venting is when you're purging the boiler, it calls the pump on for 30 seconds, off for 30 seconds, uh, and so forth. As well as venting, um, it works uh, pretty well. Maximum output there, uh, don't touch that too much uh, unless you get to a job or you install the boiler. Uh, and for some reason, the gas pipe is too small because we took out an atmosphere, that boiler was running fine, same BTU output. Just remember now we're adding a power gun, so we're gonna suck in that gas. The problem with going from atmospheric to a power burner is uh, atmospheric. If your volume is not there, your burner flame just gets smaller. Here we're sucking in the gas, you might see an issue. So if that happens here, you go to your maximum output, we do set down to get you through the night or whatever, and uh, so that way it's not stuffing out while it's going into high output. Next one down, multiple boiler uh, functions. So that's if you're uh, doing multiple boilers. You would hit that and then go into the multiple boiler function. As well as you can do either one of these encoding as well. It's a lot quicker and easier to go to your service function menu. If you make mistakes when you start up, when you start up with it, that's your initial startup where we went and did those couple of exercises, did the two uh, zone, circ uh, zone controls. If you make a mistake on your heating curve or your fixed set point, instead of going into coding, you can just restart your startup with it right from the beginning and start right over again. We do your time and date, Fahrenheit, Celsius. But when I showed you in the beginning, you can get to all those different points by uh, going through the uh, menu on the control as well. Actuator test, another good troubleshooting uh, thing, or just to make sure everything's working correctly or, do, or to do your high and low fire test.
testing, combustion testing, when they first start up the boiler or even after you service the boiler, they want you to do a high and low fire. So when you hit that actuator, it starts with all actuators off here. And each time you hit the, the down arrow, it will start uh, the next function. So if you hit your down arrow, and by the way, all the stuff you're looking at, if you don't have all this stuff tied into your boiler, like mixing valves or solar or uh, things, even the EA1 uh, extension module, um, you're not gonna see any of that here. So it's only gonna test what actuators and what outputs you have connected to the boiler or what you have communicating to the boiler. So the first thing you do is you get all actuators off, you hit your down arrow, it will put it to low fire, which is your base load. Hit your down arrow again, it will put it into full, full, full fire or full modulation. So that's where you're gonna do your high and low fire testing on this boiler. Just come here, go to your actuator test, go to base load, check your CO2s and your O2s there, and then go to full fire and check your CO2s and O2s. Remember this boiler does have Lambda Pro, so it does state in the manual, wait a good uh, 88 seconds before you throw your analyzer in the boiler because it's going through its testing procedure. Uh, with Lambda Pro, it tests in the lean and very rich, and then it goes to perfect combustion. So they're only checking for, uh, to make sure you're within the CO2s and the O2s that we're looking to achieve. To get into coding level two, once we hit the OK in the menu button, we're now gonna hit the OK and return button. So you still have to do that first spot first to get into coding level two, the menu and OK. And right after you do that, you'll see that come up. Then you're gonna go right to OK and the return arrow. Then you're gonna see coding level two come up. A lot of your coding for your boiler is gonna be done under general. Uh, some of your troubleshooting can be done under boiler as well. But when we go into the general, first thing that's gonna come up is your zero, zero. That's your system type. Uh, that's telling you uh, this one here, for example, I know that uh, number one is one heating circuit, uh, high temp with no mix, with no domestic. I know that just because I've been doing it a while, but the other thing I know is the only time you'll know that domestic is hooked to your zero, zero, is that's going to be an even number. So if you have domestic, that's going to be a two. So that would be a two would be a one high temp with domestic. As you go up, as you can see, we have 10 system types in the manual. So depending on what you're doing, that's it. Remember, auto recognition, a lot of these numbers will change auto, rec uh, auto recognized. 11 uh, is where you're making your coding change for your uh, natural gas to propane, as well as turning that dial on your gas valve. There's also a coding chain. And uh, that I always say is a key, uh, and uh, that's more for your installation part of your class. But uh, any of that information for uh, changing your natural gas to propane is right on a big sticker on the side of the boiler as soon as you take the cover off. Low loss header sensor, so remember these are auto recognized but not auto OD recognized. Uh, if you put that number five sensor, you can go here and change it here as well as you can go into your DHW programming or coding and take it out there. Just remember to unplug that number five sensor if you're not using it, as well as a low loss header. You can go here in general to number 52 uh, and take it out there if you put the low loss header sensor and you don't wanna use it. It's always defaulted to a zero. As soon as you add it, it changes that to a one automatically, but to take it out, you're gonna come back here, change that 52, hit okay here, and change that back to a, a zero. Out in the Midwest, and uh, you might have to change your uh, altitude settings as well as that's a coding card change as well for altitudes above 5,000 feet. We do find in some applications, you do not have to uh, add that in and the boiler works fine as well in some uh, altitudes. Looking at some coding changes here, uh, just uh, where you can change your pumps for different outputs. If you don't wanna use it for um, a 
a heating pump. You can use it as a DHW recirculation and things to that nature. So you can change your output uh, that 21 if you're not using domestic to a heat pump. So that will give you three uh, zone controls that you can do out, right out of the boiler instead of two, instead of adding that if you're not doing domestic out of the boiler, you're just doing heat only. You can use that domestic uh, pump as a, a heating pump. These would be the coating. I just like putting this up here for the startup wizard. This is exactly what the startup is doing for you. Prior to the startup wizard, you would have to go in and make these coating changes yourself. So now when you're picking that pump output, it's doing all these changes for you. Nine B was the last thing you would have to set if you were doing DE contact closure. So you've always had this as just a, it was a little bit involved into having end switches come over to the boiler. Uh, and now with the, the uh, startup wizard, all this stuff goes away. So you really don't have to do this programming anymore. Here you can add uh, service uh, wrenches to the boiler. So after so many hours of operation, thousands of hours of operation, uh, you'll get a little wrench up here. So the homeowner will now see the wrench on top of the screen there. It's time for the annual maintenance. You can do it with hours or you can do it with months. Okay, after 24 months, little wrench comes up here and says, oh, time to service your boiler and that's on the main screen. You can have it display or not display. That 38 is a, a, a when I was talking about boiler, as you can see, we're now encoding a boiler. So if we go back here a little bit, Once you do that, our uh, things here, instead of picking general, we went to boiler. So uh, we can go back and, and pick boiler before we get out of it or to get into boiler. Uh, your menu button, okay, and then okay, and you return, and then pick boiler. And that's where we're at with this coding here. As you can see, boiler codes. So that's where you would make these service changes, as well as, um, your maximum outputs here on the boiler, <coughs> excuse me, as well as your burner status. And that 38 is, uh, like I said, there was a little bit of troubleshooting here. If you look at the last page of your fault codes in the service menu, you're going to find uh, there's uh, four address, uh, four faults that doesn't display on the boiler. One of them can be a flow, one of them can be a low water cutoff activated. It's nice that we have lights on our low water cutoff, but if you want to go, if you go to this address 38, look at your fault code, that default will now change from a zero if it's a, a activated uh, multi-plug or your low water cutoff, that's going to be a 29 there. If you have a flow issue on this boiler, that 38 zero will now turn to a 38 three. That's a flow issue on this boiler. So that all uh, will, we go over in our troubleshooting, but I always like to throw that up there if you know the boiler fairly well and didn't know that, um, it's a nice little helpful tool. That film mode, you can activate it through uh, coding as well or going through that service menu and activate it here. But this is what it's showing you uh, what it does. So on the filling, the boiler pump is on for 20 minutes, and then uh, that helps you fill the boiler and help push the air through the boiler. Just remember on the um, medium sized boiler, uh, there's two uh, flow switches in that boiler, and there's two ball valves inside that boiler. The medium sized boiler, they have uh, two coils. So you're going to shut one coil, uh, one ball valve off inside the jacket, uh, do your venting or your fill on one coil open that one and do the opposite, open the, uh, and close that one. And it's like a split loop inside that boiler. So you're purging air through one coil, closing, and then purging air through the other coil. Here's where I was talking about that 5B code. So now you can see if you're on the primary side, remember that's if you're, uh, you're pumped for your domestics on the, the boiler side, or is it on the secondary side? Remember, it's going to activate the boiler pump or not activate the boiler pump. That's where you're going to make that coding change there. So if we go back here again, get into that coding level two, we're now going to choose domestic coding. And 
then once we're in that domestic code and now you'll that's where you're going to go make that uh am i on the primary side or the secondary side you don't do that the issues so just that's why i always like to point that out do i want the boiler pump running or do i not want the boiler pump running that's what this is doing do i want my just my pump right next to the boiler running or it's on the system side timeouts things to that nature system types um, is all done through your address zero zero um, so now you can see in system type we do now have a two before in the the prior slides we had a, a zero zero one remember that was one high temp with, without domestic so now you can see there's always going to be an even number here from your zero zero system type um, so this one here has one high temp with uh, domestic hook to the boiler remember a lot of recognize the other thing with our outdoor temperature sensor is we do have frost protection on this boiler or uh, cold weather protection on this boiler. So as soon as it hits uh, 34 degrees outside, you'll see that snowflake come up into the screen here. And that means now the boiler is being protected to, uh, and maintaining 68 degrees on that boiler, even though there's not a call from a thermostat. That's boiler protection. So if your system pump's not working or something like that, we're always maintaining the uh, temperature on the, on the boiler. Once the boiler uh, temperature, uh, outdoor temperature hits 37, that activation goes away because we're above freezing. You can actually uh, uh, adjust those temperatures when you want it to come on and off through coding uh, level two, address A3. Remember, no outdoor sensor outside, no frost protection. You will have frost protection because uh, you're going to have this uh, connected to the boiler all the time. You'll get a fault if you don't have this activated. Even if you're doing domestic only, you have to have this uh, connected to the boiler. It doesn't have to go outside. I Like my uh, domestic only, I would have it hanging on the outside of the boiler or inside the boiler and just make sure it doesn't get activated through your uh, weather. Temperatures. Touch base just a little bit on these boilers here. If you didn't know, we can do multiple boilers with this. We saw rack systems. That is our rack system here. Uh, we're doing multiple uh, boilers on this one. This just happens to be three boilers. You can have up to eight boilers on a rack system. Uh, our largest, even doing our largest boiler at 530,000 BTUs per boiler. Uh, you're up there in your BTU output. You're about uh, two million something, correct? You guys staying awake out there? All right. So to do uh, multiple boilers with this boiler here, you have to have the MW2C cascade control, which I do have set up in the lab. Uh, so you guys can come in, learn how to do uh, cascading. I give you nice little cheat sheets as well. Uh, hopefully we'll, with this being down for some time, maybe I can make a, 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 a webinar as well as a, a quick video on how to do that and get the cheat sheets. But uh, remember to get into multi-boiler setup, each boiler has to be set up into multi-boiler systems. So you're gonna go into that service function. Remember coding uh, one, that's that menu button, okay. Uh, then uh, service will come up at the top of the screen and hit okay on service functions. Scroll down to multi-boiler, then you're gonna hit okay on that check. I'm gonna put a check box in that uh, check. Once you do that, uh, you're gonna go and then uh, it's gonna say, do you wanna do that? And this, you're gonna say, hit the arrow, and say yes, hit okay. Once you hit yes, you'll see uh, the hours of time spinning there, sands of uh, time, your hourglass. And then uh, once that stops, it's gonna come into a multi-boiler setup. You'll see it. And then you have to go through and tell the boiler what boiler you are in that lineup as well as what participant are you in the lineup because our mixing valves are a participant as well. But just remember that uh, there are some things here and it's not as hard as it is, uh, uh, used to be actually. So you, with multiple boilers, you can do cascading, you can do uh, 
uh, BMS, so building management system with our veto gate uh, control, uh, BACnet, Modbus, uh, so we can do it as well as with that as well. Uh, we can now operate our domestic, uh, different temperatures, our mixing valves, and all our boilers as well. Uh, and our, our uh, roll out header sensor now goes to our main control as well as our outdoor temperature now goes to our main uh, control as well. The nice thing about doing it this way is if one boiler's down, the next one will automatically take over and, and the ease of getting them in inside of some room. So if you're doing, you know, millions of BTUs or hundreds of thousands of BTUs and you can't get our, one of our large boilers in there, think of a rack system. Uh, you can common vent up to four, four boilers on one vent system. Uh, and so that would be only two holes of drilling out uh, through the sidewalls. All right, so I kind of went over the simples of the HO1B with the screens of the two difference. You remember home screen is your rolled away of constant circulation. The circle half moon is your new, uh, new style of contact closure or sending an end switch over to the boiler. We all know why it's important to set that time of date. Remember your fault code as well as uh, any time programs you're doing or even your service uh, thing. You want that to come up at the right time of the year uh, so they're not calling you for uh, uh, maintenance at that time of the year. It's set up for them. Two different types of temperature controls. Remember we can do end switches or just a T-stat. We can uh, weather compensate or fix set point. So there's a lot of different things we can do with the boiler. And that's the neat thing with this boiler. We can do a lot of things. With that being said, hey, get your questions in now, guys. Let's ask them. All right, we have one in here, Jay. If a spiral vent is already installed on the expansion tank on the secondary side, would a spiral vent junior air eliminator on top of the low loss header be useful? Uh, if, you, if you already have one, why waste the money and put another one on? I would have did it the opposite. I would have saved the money and put the little junior high vent on that uh, low loss header. That's what I do, or a nice uh, high volume uh, air vent to push that air out. And that's all the air elimination I use. I don't have to go out, because I have to buy that low loss header for our 200s to put our sensor somewhere, or if I'm doing closely spaced T's, I would then add a, 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 a collegial or who's ever you want to use air eliminator. Uh, but uh, those uh, low loss headers work really nice and they, uh, it's gonna cost you half the money anyways uh, by doing it the other way. Our next question, can you explain the difference between contact closure and end switch? Same, they're exactly the same thing. It's just two, uh, two different ways of wording it. So that contact closure means that you're closing the contact of that relay so you're sending a signal and by the way make sure those thermostats that are sending signals over to our boiler are dry contacts so that means uh, there's no power stealing thermostats or no voltage on your thermostats because we do have 24 volts over there all right looks like so, that's the last question so it was just terminology there sometimes you know um, it's just different terminologies and how we understand it and talking to people all over the US, it's kind of funny how everybody has their own terminology. Uh, guys down south call uh, the boiler vessels kettles. So that kind of took me for uh, a loop when they were telling me about kettles. And here in the States, I have actually piped in steam kettles. So I thought they were talking about steam kettles. So it's all a learning process just on different areas of the States that I, I deal with as well. Uh, so again, I appreciate you all spending your time with me for the last couple of hours. Hopefully you picked up one or two things. If you did forget to ask any questions, uh, Miranda will have her email address up there. I answer these in uh, two or three days from now. Send them all back out to you so you can all see the answers as well as the questions that everybody's asked. So maybe you learn something from that as well. But like I said, always ask your questions and keep learning. And remember, knowledge is power. The more knowledge you have, the more power you can gain and the more money you maybe can make as a technician. That's the way I always thought anyways. So.
thanks again, and I appreciate you all coming. Have a great day. Thank you, Jay. Just a few reminders before we close out. As stated in the beginning, this will be recorded and published to our video library within the next two weeks, so you will be able to go back and rewatch it at that time. Like Jay mentioned, if you have any additional questions, my email is on the screen right now. Feel free to email me and we will put it in that document before we send it out to everyone. Keep an eye out on our website. We will be posting more webinar opportunities in the month of May. And then lastly, you will be receiving a follow-up email. We ask that you please just take the time to fill out the quick survey to help us further improve our webinars and to pick some new topics for webinars. With that being said, that does conclude our webinar today. Thank you for attending and have a wonderful day.